Here's a fact. Every single one of you is creative. Hear me out because I know some of you are like, I can't draw a straight line or my pottery pieces are so bad they scare the dog. But you were born with creative impulses and ability. How do I know that? Because you are made in the image of God and God is a creator. Got it? So by the end of this message, you're going to know what it means to be anointed for your, yes, your creative calling. Let's go. So I first became aware of God's anointing on my life riding shirtless on a tractor. I had just turned 15 years old. It's when I first got my real summer job. I was hired by the Board of Education in our town, not to teach, but to cut grass, uh, football fields, baseball diamonds. Every morning that summer, my dad would drop us off at the town garage. We would join a ragtag team of of town janitors. They called themselves J people. We're the J people. They were outdoor custodians responsible for grooming the, the town ball fields. And so my buddy Joe and I, we would pile in their pickup truck. We'd pull a giant riding tractor behind us. They'd drop us off at schools in our town and then leave me with a tractor, a tank of gas. And they'd be like, good luck. And they would just abandon us basically from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. And that's what it took for us to cut the grass of four baseball diamonds and entire football field. And all I did for hours was ride in circles, zzz, cutting grass. Now my buddy Joe would put on headphones, he'd drive off, be like, see you at lunch. But this was a summer, and so I would actually take my, my shirt off, because I was like, hey, let me get a tan while, while I'm mowing. And I didn't listen to music to pass the time, but on Mondays I would, I would get on that tractor and I'd be riding around in circles, and I would actually think about Sunday morning, because my parents dragged me to church at the time, and the sermons were, well, boring for a 16 year old. And so on the tractor, while I would go in circles, I would rewrite the sermon in my head. I'd be like, well, if I were doing that, I would change the opening. I actually would tell a joke here. And then I would put a movie clip to illustrate it. And on that tractor, I would actually re-preach the sermon from Sunday. I mean, can you imagine? I was driving around, I would use hand motion. I'd be like, blah, 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 blah. I'd tell a joke and I would laugh. (laughs) I must've looked crazy. In fact, two of the janitors pulled up and they, they, they waved me over and they're like, hey, is everything okay? We got a call from a neighbor and she said there's a shirtless kid riding around talking to himself, waving his hands, laughing. And the head janitor just goes, are you on drugs? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm re-preaching a, a sermon for, to make church more engaging. And the other janitor's like, he's definitely on drugs. <laughs> and, and that's when I first became aware of God's anointing on my life, that he had planted this unique gift in me. There's this powerful passion to communicate the gospel in in a fresh way to a new generation. At 15 years old, I'm preaching to the birds and the barn swallows out in a football field in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. But I just had this sense that God had given me a key role to play in building his kingdom. And that someday maybe he might use me for his purposes if I stayed humble and teachable. Now, fast forward 10 years. Now I'm 26 years old. And I landed my first adult job after college teaching English to a bunch of seniors at Summit High School. They actually called my class Motorhead English because so many of my students were left behind. They were seniors, fifth year seniors. They had no interest in school. They just wanted to get out. And my job as a rookie teacher was to teach them Shakespeare. Good luck, pretty low motivation. So I'd uh, come up with creative ways to teach uh, this ancient text and I would experiment. I'd say, hey guys, we're gonna read this, this little excerpt from Macbeth, but now I wanna show you a movie clip of Denzel Washington. <laughs> In fact, let's act it out. And so like word and video image, stories, music, movies, I'd use, I'd marry them all together. And suddenly this, this ancient book that they couldn't decode would just spring to life. And the students actually started enjoying English and I realized, wow, I really enjoy teaching. Now connect the dots, 16 years old, God spoke to me on a tractor. You're chosen. I have a role for you to play. 10 years go by, 26 years old. God speaks to me in a dusty classroom. I've anointed you. I want to use your gift to teach a new generation. That was God's training ground for me. When I was teaching, I would always feel this deep sense of God's pleasure. I'd be like, man, I I was made for this. This may not be what I do for the rest of my life, but I know this is what God wants me to do right now. I had never preached. In fact, the first time I preached publicly was at my grandpa's funeral. My grandpa died tragically. He was actually run over by a car in his living room. It's a whole nother story. Our family was filled with grief and they said, maybe maybe Tim can speak for all of us. Can, Can you do the eulogy, Tim? You're good with words. And so I did. I prayed and I 
I opened my Bible. I was like, what does scripture have to say about grief and finding meaning in tragedy? And because his death was so unusual, hundreds of people came to it. And I kind of just painted this picture of how God is telling a story with each of our lives. It's like he's weaving a tapestry and all we see is like the underbelly, which looks like this random jumble of tangled threads, right? Like knotted like needlepoint. I was like, but if you flip that tapestry over and you look from heaven's perspective, you'll see God is, is weaving this beautiful tapestry, working all things for our good and for his glory if we'll trust him. At the end of that eulogy, I gave, I don't know, an invitation to receive Christ as Savior. And to my shock, dozens of people responded. It was a surreal and I would say supernatural moment. Because yes, my grandpa died, but dozens of people were born again at his funeral. And I knew in that moment that God had given me a gift. I knew that I was anointed and had a role to play in his kingdom, but I wasn't sure where or how. Until the funeral ended and, and, and we're standing in the receiving line, shaking hands, thanking people, thanks for coming. And this older man with gray hair and piercing gray eyes, he squeezed my hand and he wouldn't let go. And he just goes, what do you do? And I said, I, I, I'm sorry. He goes, what do you do for a living, son? And I was like, oh, I, I, I'm an English teacher. And he squeezed my hand like he was going to break. And he just goes, you need to quit that job right now. Don't spend one more day. God anointed you to preach his word. And I was like, well, take it back. I was like, okay, thanks very much. He goes, no, listen to me, son. And he pulled me in. He goes, God's anointed you. He's given you a gift. It is time to unleash it. You should be a pastor in full-time ministry. It turns out that was an older wiser pastor named John Strain from Toms River, New Jersey. And I'll never forget that moment when, when an older Elijah called out in a younger Elisha a fresh anointing. Guys, that was a moment that God used to convince me to actually step out of teaching, which I loved, enter full-time ministry, become a pastor, and eventually start Liquid Church. Praise God he uses any of us, isn't it? Yeah? I, I think back to the boy on that tractor, and if you had told my 16-year-old self, one day I would get to serve you all and to teach the word of God to thousands of people and, and help you hear God's voice and his plan for your life. If you told me that, hey, together, we're going to bring clean water to thousands of kids in Africa. We're going to launch eight campuses and more to come. If you told my 16-year-old self on the tractor all that was going to happen, I would say he's definitely on drugs. <laughs> Friends, make no mistake. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are chosen by God for a divine purpose. Before the foundations of the world, he called you by name, Ryan, Clint. He shaped you in your mama's womb, Denise, Kyra. He gave you spiritual gifts and a key role to play in his rescue mission to this dying world. More than that, you are anointed by Christ. As a blood-bought believer, Jesus has anointed you with his Holy Spirit. And he will unleash gifts in your life to be used for his glory and bless a broken world. If you're new and you're like, anointing, what is the anointing? We've been talking about this for a couple weeks. The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit in and on a Christian's life. And I first became aware of God's anointing at 16 years old, covered in grass clippings on a tractor. And then 26 years old, there was a second kind of activation covered in chalk dust in a classroom. And I was 36 years old when God called us to start this church. Do the math. 20 years between God's anointing and his appointing. People look at our church and, and, and sometimes people say, how did all of this suddenly happen? And I tell them, we're an overnight success, 20 years in the making. <laughs> See, there's always a gap between God's anointing and his appointing. But the Bible shows us if you will stay faithful and seek God's face, he will increase your level of impact. You may not know that. Did you know it's possible to increase your level of anointing and usefulness to God? Two weeks ago, I told you about King Saul and King David. Like you, both men chosen by God. Like you, both men anointed. Both men become king over Israel. But what? Saul lost his anointing because he disobeyed God. And God said, I'm going to choose somebody else. David, who's just a boy at the time. Somewhere between probably 10 and 15 years old. You remember I showed you the two scariest verses of the Bible? In walks David, the little shepherd kid, the run of the litter, and the Lord said, that's the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he brought, anointed David with the oil, and the spirit of the Lord 
came powerfully upon David from that day on. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul. Isn't that scary? Two people, both chosen anointed, two totally different outcomes in life. Saul or David, which are you? King Saul had a crown. He had public power, authority, a platform, but no anointing. The Holy Spirit left him. David had the anointing, but no crown. And it turns out God's anointing has nothing to do with your age or your experience, your power, your position, or whether you have a platform or followers and insert or not. God chooses who he chooses and he uses who he uses. And God chose David. I want that one. What you didn't know and I didn't know is that God didn't just anoint David one time. You know how many times he anointed David? Three times. Did you know that? David is the only person in all of scripture who was anointed three different times. The Bible says God anointed David a second time after Saul died. It says this, then the men of he Judah came to Hebron and there they anointed David king over the tribe of what? Of Judah. David's second anointing happened a decade later after his first, after Saul died. And the nation was split in two. Judah was in the south. Israel was in the north. So the tribe of Judah anoints David as their king. But guess what? It took another seven and a half years before David united the tribes and actually sat on the throne over all Israel. Catch this, young people. It took a full 20 years before David was anointed king over the whole nation. It says, when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, they anointed David king over Israel, and David was how old, church? 30 years old when he became king. And he reigned 40 years. Two decades between David's first anointing and his final anointing. He was 30 years old, the same age that Jesus began his earthly ministry. It just makes you wonder, like, why did God make David wait so long? Why the gap, God, between my anointing and my appointing? And here's the answer. David was in training for reigning. God was training him, testing him. He was maturing his soul so he could handle the role. And understand if you're anointed, you will always be in training to level up your walk with God. Each anointing brought a new level of battle, spiritual warfare, trials and tests to mature David's leadership. And as David passed each test, his power and his influence increased to a new level each time. So be patient, friends. God has more for you, for, 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 for me, for you, for all of us. Did you know that? You can always have more of the Holy Spirit, amen? The real question is, can the Holy Spirit have more of you? I, I'm, I'm talking to young people right now in their teens, 20s, and 30s. Maybe you're, you're here today and you have this, this vague sense God wants to do big things through your life. You don't even know yet. You just know you've got this, you've got a few gifts, but you're not sure what God's calling you to do. Be patient. God has a next level of anointing for you. But I also want to speak to older Christians. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're a little bit older and honestly, you feel a little spiritually flat. Uh -uh. A little tired. You're like, I'm, I'm 59, I'm 62. I, I, maybe God's done with me. I'm just going to play pickleball in Florida. Listen to me, Jared. If you're not dead, God's not done. It is never too late to level up your anointing. You're annoying. <laughs> you're anointing. God's got fresh oil for you, not just in ministry, but fresh oil in the classroom, fresh oil in the boardroom, fresh oil on the athletic field, the band room, the boardroom, the design studio. God needs anointed leaders in every field and profession. Amen? Today, I want to teach you how to level up your anointing. But be warned. Anytime a Christian steps forward to take new ground for God, she should expect opposition, spiritual pushback. The devil will harass and try to intimidate you because he does not want to see you walk in your full anointing. So if you want to level up, get ready. Every level, another devil. <laughs> you ready to go? I want to show you two quick tests God used to mold David into a man after God's own heart and just conform his character to Christ. The first test is this, if you're taking notes, if you are anointed by God for great things, you have to expect family opposition. Your family ain't gonna understand everything. Some of you come from homes where you're the only Christian and everyone else thinks this, this Jesus stuff you're very excited about is nonsense. Well, it's just for weak people. It ain't easy and it, it wasn't easy for David. 
When Samuel first came to David's father to anoint a new king, you know what Jesse didn't even bring David out? <laughs> like he brought out his seven older sons. Remember Eliab, tall, muscular, Jack Reacher, Abinadab, Shemaiah, and God's like, nope, 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 anyone else? And his father is like, well, there's my, my little boy out in the backyard watching sheep. You can't mean David. And the Lord said, that's the one. Anoint him. You look at the outward appearance, I look at the heart. Not everyone, even your own family, will understand your anointing. David's own father overlooked him, underestimated him. I can't imagine this thing of that. My, personally, I was very blessed to have a supportive family. My father always affirmed and encouraged me. He was a cheerleader. But I have many friends who never tasted that. Listen, your earthly father or mother may not support you or affirm you or validate your gifts, which I believe is part of a parent's God-given role. It's the cheerlead for their children, uncover their buried glory. But I came to tell somebody, you have a father in heaven who sees you, who has chosen you, who has called you by name, ransomed you by the blood of his son, and given you gifts to be unleashed. And when God anoints you, it doesn't matter what people say. Did you know Jesus' own family thought he was crazy? The moment Jesus started operating in the anointing, healing the sick, kicking out demons, the Bible says when his family heard about this, they wanted to take charge of Jesus, for they said, he's out of his mind. Like if, if they called Jesus crazy, what are they gonna say about you? <laughs> so don't be discouraged if your family is in support of your calling. When you leave and cleave to your father in heaven, the Holy Spirit will give you actually a healthy sense of leaving your family of origin behind. Not in a bad way, but you will be empowered to differentiate between the voice of your Abba, your heavenly father, and have strength to step over the criticisms. David had a lot to step over. <laughs> Here's another snapshot. Look, after he's anointed his three oldest brothers, they go off to war. They join the Israelite army to go fight the Philistines. And you know what his dad makes David do as his first assignment? Okay, you're anointed. You ready? You're the pizza delivery boy. Look quickly, 1 Samuel 17, 17. It says, now Jesse said to his son David, take these 10 loaves of what, church? Of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp and take along these 10 what? These cheeses to the commander of their unit. Everyone say 10 breads. Say 10 cheeses. Now say pizza, pizza. <laughs> I ain't kidding. David's first job is doing DoorDash. <laughs> He's the pizza delivery guy for his brothers who are fighting the Philistines. I'm just telling you, despise not the day of small beginnings, says the Lord. My anointing as a boy started unattractive. This church began a hotel ballroom. But when the Holy Spirit hits, watch out, it's powerful. Watch this. You'd think David's brothers would be like, oh, David's here, free pizza. But look what the Bible says. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, what, what are you doing here? Why'd you, why'd you come down here? <laughs> Why'd you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You got a bad heart, Mike. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, <laughs> said David? Can't I even speak? Does this sound like anyone's dinner table? Anyone have that? Okay. Imagine David, the poor kid, brings down free pizza to his brothers. And Eliab is like, you little punk, you little perv. I know how conceited you are, how bad your heart is. You just came to watch the front lines and get some glory. Psst, can you hear it? All the air going out of young David's heart. Nothing deflates you like arrows aimed at your heart from your own family. Anybody here have a sibling with the spiritual gift of criticism? Anybody? Like really know how to like slice and dice and aim an insult. Maybe you're in the crosshairs. Don't be discouraged. If you are anointed, you will be attacked. You'll be criticized. You will be trolled. You'll be made fun of. Sometimes the people closest to you, a brother, a sister, a relative, even an ex, will, will question your motives. Why are you doing this? Oh, I see. You're the God guy now. You're the God girl. It's funny, I remember when I first told my family, I felt the Holy Spirit calling me to actually leave my teaching position, become a pastor. And I assumed my parents would be supportive, and they were, but my grandmother, good old grandma, she loved the Lord, she loved Jesus. And she said, Timmy, are you sure that's a smart idea? I was like, what's that, grandma? She's like, you'll lose your benefits. You won't have a pension. I'm like, what's a pension? 
And when I realized what she was saying, I looked at grandma and I was like, get behind me, Satan. No, I didn't say that. I thought it, I didn't say it. Understand grandma wasn't trying to discourage me, but the devil was trying to use her words to do that. Older believers, you got to learn to speak life over your children. Cheerlead your kids. I believe in God. I believe in you. Understand anytime a believer takes a step towards their destiny, you will get hit with criticism and discouragement. Who does he think he is? She's just trying to look good. They will question your motives, question your mind, just like David, just like Jesus. But I'm just telling you, if you're anointed, don't try to explain yourself. Don't try to convince them. You need to step over it. That is part of God's training if you want to level up your anointing. You got to become highly skilled at stepping over stuff. Because remember, grandma's not the enemy. Say, say to your neighbor, they're not the enemy. The anointing is operating in a supernatural space. There is a spiritual battle going on. The Bible says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not your brother, it's not your sister, it's not grandma, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, where? In the heavenly realms. So your spiritual enemy, the devil, will try to use human words to discourage you, but they're not the enemy. And God's anointing will provide the protection. So the enemy is going to turn up the attack. Now, I don't want to freak you out, but David steps over this family opposition and is immediately hit with demonic intimidation. Test number two, and this is a giant one. I mean, literally, his name's Goliath. To intimidate the Israelites, the Philistines send out their ultimate warrior. It says, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. And he was over how tall? Nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. This guy is a giant, like over nine feet tall, broke and dunk on LeBron, okay? 125 pounds of armor. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a, a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Goliath, man, this guy is armed to the teeth. Now, here's what's interesting. I just read you a, a modern translation. But if you read the original Hebrew, it says he was six cubits tall, wore six pieces of armor, and his spear weighed 600 shekels. Six, six, six. It's the number of the Antichrist. You get it? It's, it's Samuel saying, Goliath is satanic. And he taunts God's people. He says, choose one man. Come on. Come on down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him, you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Can you imagine? Scripture says Goliath did this every morning and every night for 40 days. Can you imagine? This satanic assassin comes out 80 times to troll God's army. You want a piece of me, Phil? You? How about you, Chris? Yeah, that's what I thought. The intimidation worked. Verse 11 says, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were what? They were terrified and deeply shaken. Enter pizza delivery boy. David's dropping off DoorDash and he hears Goliath mocking God, which somehow triggers his anointing. Listen to what he says. You're going to want to write this down. This is hilarious. David is such a G. David asked the men standing near him, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should define the armies of the living God? Boom, roasted. Kids, next time someone challenges you at school, you say, try me, you uncircumcised Philistine. No, don't say that. Think it. Don't say it. What happens next is not what you think. Listen, I know everyone here right now, you're all like, oh, I know this story. David takes his like a little slingshot out of his pocket. He, he throws the rock, pew, pew, pew. And he pegs Goliath in the head. You know the Sunday school story. But there's more going on supernaturally here. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. I'll go fight him. And Saul like, what? <laughs> appreciate passion, kid. You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior 
from his youth. King Saul's being nice here. He literally is like, kid, I, uh, I see your moxie. <laughs> I appreciate your passion. <laughs> but Goliath is a train killer. He is a Navy SEAL on steroids. And you're just a boy. You have no experience. Now remember something. The Holy Spirit had left Saul. So Saul leads out of fear. He's actually talking David's faith down. And he didn't realize David had a secret weapon. Remember, he's been in training for reigning. But David said to Saul, no, 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 yeah, yeah, let me tell you something. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. And what did I do? I, I had struck it. <laughs> and, and then I killed it. I yanked the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized that sucker by its hair and I struck it and killed it. I told you, David is a G, man. Yeah, you're, you're all like, I, th I thought he was out in the, sh in, in the field writing like poems and psalms. Yeah. He watched the sheep in the backyard, but he was in training for reigning. God was preparing him for the promotion. He had a shepherd's heart, but when a lion came in, zing, I nailed that sucker. And when a bear turned on me, I grabbed it by the fur and I killed it. What? Yeah, David had a worship anointing, but he was a warrior anointing. So he's like, with all due respect, Mr. King Saul, I, I could probably handle myself. With the help of my God, I have killed lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Catch this. Saul was older, but he was spiritually hollow. David was younger, but he had a depth of faith, a vibrancy. He had a fresh anointing, and watch this, a day-by-day -day dependency on the Holy Spirit. That's actually where his confidence comes from. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. He's going to be like one of them because he has to fight who? Me? Uh-uh. The armies of the living God. This is not just youthful enthusiasm. David isn't even aware or concerned with promotion. He is fighting for the Lord's honor. Where does his bold faith come from? Listen to his words. David said to the Philistines, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and cut your head off. Woo, can you feel it? Like this kid, man, he's like, he, done had, he had a Red Bull. He had a Celsius before he went on out there. He is full of bold faith. He's like, my giant may be big, but my God is a lot bigger. You know who you're messing with? I'm God's anointed and I'm fighting you in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, all those gathered here will know that it's not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he's gonna give all of you into our hands. David had a secret weapon, a firsthand experience walking with the Holy Spirit. He had a depth of soul, a secret life with God that he could draw on when the test came. Listen, young people. Before God promotes you in public, he will train you in private. In fact, I believe humble service is what positions you for public promotion. You know what that means? You're not just delivering pizza. You're not just serving coffee. You're not just mowing grass. You're not just babysitting. You are in training for reigning. And the God inside of you is bigger than the giant in front of you. Amen? Amen. Make some noise if you believe it, church. Oh, I feel it. Come on. I don't need no spear, no javelin. Who got some rocks? You ready to get stoned? Come on. It says, then David took his staff. Not that kind of stone, Phil. <laughs> Raise your, come on. <laughs> then he took his staff in his hand and he chose how many? Five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now hit pause. Anybody know why David chose five? Five smooth stones, they were river rocks. Of course not, you're not Jewish. <laughs> this is symbolic. Every Jew would have understood. The five stones represented the first five books of the Jewish Bible, the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, David's life. I'm gonna fight the words of my giant with the words of my God. And David is listening to God's word, not man's opinion. Young people, the most powerful thing you can do when you're young is reading God's word, feeding on it every single day. 
If you want to activate your anointing, you've got to hide God's word in your heart because it's the purity that attracts God's power. David picked five smooth stones. How many know God only needs one? <laughs> can, can I show you something? I, I saw it, I was like, that is fire. Again, you all think he had this like, little slingshot, like pew, pew. This is not a pea shooter, friends. Have you ever seen a trained Middle Eastern shepherd use a real life sling? Check out this video I found on Instagram Reels. What? I'm looking at Reels, my wife's like, turn the light off, you're just wasting time on Reels. I'm like, I'm doing sermon research. You wanna see it again, it's so short, show it again. This is so fire, look at this thing. David used God's word as a weapon and he brings Goliath down with a single stone like a laser guided GPS to his forehead, smack! And the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell what? Backwards? Forwards. Face down on the ground. Why face down? Because even demons have to bow before the living God, amen? Give him a praise, church. This is God fighting for his anointed and your God has never lost a battle. Let me tell you something. Spiritual warfare is just part of the deal. It's part of God's training for reigning. And it's not pretty, it's not easy. In fact, I wanna share something with you that I debated whether to share this. It's kind of freaky. But when Colleen and I first launched Liquid as a ministry, and suddenly we had hundreds of young adults started coming and, and they were giving their lives to Christ. And we had this growing sense God wanted to, to use Liquid in a unique way to impact the next generation for Jesus. And so one Saturday, Colleen and I went to the store to buy snacks for liquid. We were just volunteers at the time. We had to pay for the snacks and everything, you know? And so we get into the checkout line, and the girl in front of us, she's like 20-something, college age. She has this huge shopping cart crammed full of alcohol. Like, not just beer, but like the hard stuff, like vodka, tequila, you know? And, and here we are standing there with our Doritos and our soda. And her friends come with this, this stack of six-packs, and they boom, pile on the cart, and the clerk is like, hey, big party. And these college girls just start going off. They're like, yeah, we're going to get lit, you know. And they're talking like very crudely about partying and hooking up. And I think they actually had drunk a little already. And out of nowhere, this one girl says, at least Lisa and her loser friends won't be there, stupid Christians. Oh, yeah, I know. They're such prudes, losers, no brains. Everyone hates them. And they literally spontaneously all start hating on the stupid Christians on our campus. And the clerk just says, yeah, and starts laughing. And Colleen and I are just standing there with our snacks for liquid. And it like dawned on me, these are the people we're trying to reach. 20-somethings who are completely lost, without purpose, without Christ. And so we paid and got in the car. And driving home, I, I, just, I just felt deflated. And as I was driving, something supernatural happened. It never happened before. It's never happened since. But I was driving. I'll never forget this. I felt this invisible but palpable presence in our car just come over me. It was like this heavy weighted blanket, this overwhelming sense of oppression. And I'm driving and literally like my hands froze and I suddenly felt paralyzed. Like I couldn't move. And Kyle's like, Tim, I didn't answer her question. I, I couldn't move my, my lips or speak. And Kyle was like, honey, honey, what's wrong? I just looked at her like this, like just help. And she goes, honey, pull, pull over. And, 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 and we pulled off to the shoulder. And I literally couldn't speak. I couldn't lift my arms. And my lips wouldn't move. And I remember hearing this voice as clear as day in my head. Ask, who the F do you think you are? I run this town. This is my show. I, I, I wrote it down and I knew it was the voice of a demon because I don't talk that way and my daddy didn't talk that way. And it was very scary. It was very intimidating. And I'm just sitting there and Colleen just put her hands on me and just started praying for me and just rebuking the devil with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I remember crying, and after just two or three minutes, it passed. But it was like this invisible, palpable wave of oppression. 
And I look back now and I realize it was demonic intimidation. The, the next day I told my pastor and he said, oh, Tim, make no mistake, that's 100% the voice of the enemy. He goes, it's not a coincidence. You're trying to birth a new ministry and the devil's trying to smother it before it's even born. And I didn't understand that at the time. But looking back now, I realized that was a satanic attack. Because we had this burning passion to reach the next generation with the saving message of Jesus Christ. And understand, anytime you step into your anointing to take new ground for the kingdom, the enemy will oppose you. He will attack you. He will threaten you and hit you with whispers of fear, accusing voices. Who the F do you think you are? You think you're going to change the party culture on campuses of Christ? I own that. Don't mess with me. They're mine. The Bible calls Satan the accuser. And if you dare attempt something great for God, the enemy will attack you with voices and whispers. Who do you think you are to fill in the blank? Foster a child. What? Who do you think you are to start your own business? Who do, who do you think you are to fight human trafficking? Fight for the unborn? You're just a stay-at-home mom or poor college student. You can't have an impact. It is a textbook satanic strategy 101. It's spiritual warfare. The enemy will use fear and intimidation to discourage you from stepping up. And if you listen, I'm just telling you, that voice will paralyze you. You will stay stuck and do nothing. And that's why you must learn to fight back in the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God says, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives where? In the world. In other words, Satan may be strong, but the Holy Spirit is stronger. Amen? God, listen, Satan is God's enemy. He's not God's equal. So listen, young people, when you step into your anointing, the accuser will try to strike fear in your heart because he's threatened by you. Do you understand this? Satan is threatened. Hell hates a spirit-filled believer who hits back with bold faith. And in that moment, you better learn to rebuke that unclean spirit in Jesus' name. You better stand on God's word, pray with authority, and you tell him, greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. Amen? <laughs> David had the X factor. And so do you. You got it too. It's in you. I don't know what enemy intimidation you're facing today. What voices you're listening to. The voice of fear, discouragement. But the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God didn't say the weapon wouldn't form. He promised it wouldn't prosper. If God has anointed you, who's going to be against you? In Christ, we are more than conquerors. Now watch David run into his destiny. I love this. It says, then David ran over. He pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Look at this painting by my favorite artist, Caravaggio. Ooh, I told you David was a gangster. Keep the change, you filthy animal. Look at that, man. Think of all David overcame. The negative voice of his family, demonic intimidation. He lives into his anointing. He runs headlong into his destiny. The key God role that God picked him to play in his larger story of salvation. And so must you, my friends. Friends, the world's getting darker. What does it need? Right now, our world is desperate to see authentic, spirit-filled, anointed Christians who are full of a bold faith, unafraid to live into your true calling in Christ. Young people, you are in training for reigning. And if you will invest the time now to nurture a firsthand walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, to hide his word in your heart, to stay humble, never be too big to do the small stuff like deliver pizza or be a buddy to middle schoolers. If you can step over criticism and remember that the God inside of you, oh man, he's so much bigger than the giant in front of you. God will change the trajectory of your whole life, your whole family, whole generations, amen? Look at me, don't follow someone else's script for your story. Don't fight battles in your own strength. Our world needs humble, anointed men and women who are just so anchored in the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, that they smash satanic strongholds and bring freedom to captive people, amen? By God's grace, Christians should be the freest people on the planet. You're not a slave to fear. We're full of faith. We are the anointed children of God. Give them a praise if you agree. <laughs> David's story is our story. It's your story, so step into it, amen? Let's stand and pray together. Stand with me, would you? Oh, Father, I feel it. I pray today there would be a voice like a laser shot to the heart of a man or a woman here who is standing on the threshold of moving into their anointing. Level them up, God. 
level them up. Open your word. Let it explode like a grenade in their heart and tell them there's more. If you're here today, you want more of the Holy Spirit, raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of hands. Guess what? God's raising his hand. He says, I want more of you. I want more of you. So say, God, here I am. Just say it out loud. God, here I am. Fill me. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Sit on the throne of my heart. I'm here to serve you. Forgive me for my sins. Protect me from the enemy. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to make an eternal impact. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said, amen. Give God a praise, church. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you are blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.